welcome you. This is the first time we've had a tour with the Women's Giving Circle, and so I'd like to thank the Human Mobility uh, Research Lab okay. for uh, having us here today. Um, before we get started with the lab tour, I just wanted to bring everyone up to date with the latest news on the Women's Giving Circle. Uh, we did put out our first call for research proposals, and the area that the women selected was in the area, area of aging research. The competition has uh, closed now, and we understand from Dr. Roger Daly that there were 10 very good applications that came in for the funding. And the, they're just going through the process now of vetting all the research proposals, and uh, they'll be back to us, with, I'm sure, within about a month's time, with those proposals ranked. And so at our next event in May, there'll be an announcement on uh, who was successful in obtaining the funding for this year. So it's very exciting. and. Um, Dr. Dooley mentioned it was very well received, so I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, contributions to date. We very much uh, appreciate it. And as far as our membership drive goes, uh, Sean, what, uh, how many people are we up to now? Still 60. About 60, which is great. Um, Shirley would like us to be up to 100. Shirley, <laughs> 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 Sean, <laughs> everybody brought one person. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, uh, so we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to continue to attract more members uh, as we move forward. And at our May event, we'll be doing more publicity around the Women's Giving Circle when we announce uh, who were the successful researcher or researchers. So yeah, that's where we are today. So today we're at the uh, Human Ability Research Laboratory. It's something that's very near and dear to my heart because uh, one of my jobs when I joined uh, Queen's University was to start up the Human Mobility Research Center, uh, which is um, a lab uh, in KGH, and it's a partnership between uh, the hospitals and also industry. And it brings together engineering, orthopedic surgeons, uh, <coughs> rehabilitation specialists, computer scientists, uh, uh, rheumatologists, anyone who's interested really in uh, mobility research, and it brings them all together to develop new and innovative ways to uh, help people with their mobility. So some of the exciting work that's been done is in the area of uh, computer-assisted orthopedic surgery. One of the big projects was always envisioned that if you were in a bad accident and had uh, a, a bad fracture, that they could use computer graphics to put the bones back together again and then the surgeon could follow the surgical plan. So uh, an operating room was called OR2010, it was built at KGH. And, uh, and that group has gone on to achieve uh, world-renowned success, which is great because uh, my daughter just fractured her ankle <laughs> <laughs> quite badly uh, in uh, Montreal, and uh, they didn't have any of that technology there. And my son, on the weekend, has a his shoulder, so <laughs> I come from uh, frequent flyers in the orthopedic field, so I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited about this research. Some of the other projects this group's been working on happen to be developing a uh, foot for landmine survivors uh, that's actually uh, in use now in uh, many of the developing countries. Uh, they're very active in tissue engineering. And um, the area we're going to hear about today has to do with uh, GATE. Uh, this is a brand new lab, and Dr. Kevin Deluzio, who uh, is the principal researcher for this facility, is going to share with us um, what's, uh, what's going on in this facility. Okay. So, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> Yes, so I met Mark when I came to, I was, came to Queens, I've been here now uh, six or seven years ago, and I think when I met Mark, she said, okay, this will be great, we'll have this lab ready in a year or so. I think we, <laughs> two, we walked around this facility about seven years, seven or eight years ago. This used to be the kitchen of the, of the old Hotel Du. So where you were, there was a huge fume hit right there. And, uh, so it, the deconstruction, demolition, and, and uh, acquisition of funds, and uh, then construction and selection of equipment um, has taken us about five or six years to, to, uh, to accomplish. We're pretty proud of the facility that we have here. It's a state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility um, equipped um, equal to the top labs of, of its kind in, in the world. And we have some unique equipment. Uh, we're the only place in Canada that has some of this equipment that's in, in the lab here. We've been running for about a year. I think we had our grand opening last May, so it's really nice that we're actually collecting data and stuff. Um, and we're, uh, so you're all sitting, so this is a lab tour, so we're gonna get you up in a little bit. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're concerned with mobility, concerned with measuring mobility, we're, we're concerned with understanding how 
mobility and how specific ways that you walk or you do things affect why some people get mobility problems and others don't. And we're concerned with optimizing those things. So what I'm going to, what we're going to do, just to give you a brief kind of overview where we are, I'm going to give a few boring kind of slide overview things that I think will help uh, put things in perspective. And then we've got, around me, uh, we have um, graduate students and technicians that work in the area. They'll introduce each other, but I'll give you, a, as you as you have a chance to interact with them. But going around, Scott Brandon is a PhD student. Beside him is Marcus Brown, who's a master's student. Hanan Hassandi is a uh, PhD student from Brazil who's doing a work term here, uh, spending a year with us. Um, and the, the, the man in, in the white dots is an undergraduate mechanical engineering student uh, who's uh, choosing between graduate programs now, Berkeley, MIT, uh, who else is on the top of that list? Queens. Oh, good. <laughs> I'd like to hear that. Uh, uh, up, up, to, up top is Liz, another PhD student. And then uh, my boss, the one that runs the whole thing, is Amy uh, Morgan, who's been with us last year. So they're going to show you some of their particular works. You'll get a chance to see some of them kind of in a general sense. And then after about 15 or 20 minutes, you can get a chance to try stuff as well. I've got some sensors and things that you may want to uh, 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 see how it feels. OK. Um, let's push a button there. Uh, so what I thought we I thought I'd draw rather than we do a lot of different things here. We talk about we have we have studies that are going on in hip arthritis and hip replacements. We've got studies that are going on upper arm motion. But I'm going to talk specifically about a single case, and that's total knee replacement. So total knee replacement is very common. Many of you know people, or maybe you yourself have has had a, a knee replacement, and. We're at the point now where this technology has been with us about 30, 35 years, and we're asking a lot more from this technology. It's doing really well. If you look at knee replacements, this is the 53, this is a piece of um, ivory. This implant here is kind of an ivory. It was just kind of jammed into the knee joint to separate the cartilage from one, one, joint, one surface to the other to, to get to some pain relief. The, Evolution, you can see when they say, well, that's not working. The next one you see is actually by a Canadian gunsman. Uh, 1969, you see, okay, let's start making these in metal. And then you say, well, actually, the knee joint has two surfaces. Maybe we should replace both of those. And we start getting into metal. And now we're talking about some metal and plastic articulating against each other. These are drastic changes in these decades. And then by about the 80s, um, which is when I started working in this area, the implant that we have there looks pretty similar to what we have as state of the art right now. So the changes now to implants are kind of smaller. They're not those drastic as it going to work. Knee replacement surgery, I love this line, is one of the most successful surgeries you can do to something. Second to one, heart surgery. Because when you come in for needing heart surgery, you're going to die, and you didn't. So you're, you know, <laughs> ranking it really, you, I'm really happy. So second to that is knee and hip replacement surgery. So it really works. When we talk about measuring this, though, because that's what, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, and I want to measure things. I'm actually a mathematician, so I really like numbers and math and measuring things. So we want to measure things, and this is what we do in science and research. We measure some kind of outcome as opposed to as we introduce these technologies. And for this first chunk of time, we saw huge changes in, in outcome. Again, the people couldn't walk, now they could. So the changes within each incremental piece of technology delivered really big improvements in outcome. In where we are now, and I would say this phase two would have entered into the uh, late 80s, 90s, and where we saw was a plateauing effect. Now that plateauing effect has got to do with a number of things. First off, the measures that we use for outcome are pretty crude. They were questionnaire-based surgeons saying, can they walk, can they can't walk? Um, they weren't designed for small changes in quality of life that we, that we were expecting to get. And also the design changes. The, if we think of what the, the primary goal of something like a joint replacement is, and this is true for many muscular you know, orthopedic procedures, to restore function. We're not functioning, we're not doing the things we want to be able to do, so we need some kind of corrective procedure to help us with that. Those outcome measures weren't particularly well suited to measuring function. They didn't actually measure function. 
We looked at the neck, you know, it was an x-ray, saying it was the implant staying where we put it. You know, that was a good outcome. Or was the, you know, was the person, was, did the pain go down? Obviously that's an important thing, but we want more of that. Especially if you look at where we are demographically right now. We have an aging population, the baby boomers are all, you know, getting into the 50s and 60s, and we're starting to get orthopedic problems, but we want to maintain the healthy lifestyle that we've been accustomed to. So our expectations are getting higher. We want to be able, we want, when, I remember when I was taught um, by the first um, uh, orthopedic surgeon I worked with here was uh, Dr. Charles Sorby. And he explained at that time that knee replacement surgery, the goal for many of these people is to so they can get up and change the channel on the TV. You know, they can move around in the house, right? It wasn't, now we have people saying, I want to go climb a mountain. I want to keep hiking. I want to keep playing tennis. I, well, that's a real challenge to us as mechanical engineers and designers. Um, and a challenge in terms of the scientists to how do we measure that. So that's what this lab is about. Measuring function, as I like to say, we get into this third phase, where now the next I think what we're going to see in implants now is implants that allow us to not only just uh, 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 get beyond disability, but really be able to be thrive. So the, this facility, this big empty space in Hotel Du, boy, when you're, when you're a researcher you're looking for space and money and you tell people that you want a big empty space, they, it's really hard to get. <laughs> and even after we finished building the space and had everything and it was all basically looking like today, you know, the hospital administrators and the, uh, you know, the, the, the powers that be, when are you going to fill it with equipment? This is it. Why did you need all this space? Because we need the space. Because we want to measure function. So what we want to do in this, in, in this space is have people perform activities of daily living or uh, leisure activities and measure what's going on. And we're going to show you a bit of how we do that in the next little bit. When we put some markers on here, you can see one of our students. And they, you do things, and we can quantify how well you do. And we can compare that to help people that do that that are healthy. And we can compare that on a pretty sophisticated scale comparing, for example, two different surgical procedures different implants in The goal of all this is the center of it, you know, keeping people active. We know, you know, there's, it, there's a vicious cycle if somebody starts to get um, a musculoskeletal problem in the sense that uh, the activity level goes down. So now the weight goes up. Then the activity level goes further down. Then the heart doesn't work as well because it's not going to. So you have this, you know, vicious cycle of everything coming up upon this. Our goal is to keep people maintaining active lifestyle. So we'd like to be able to assess function. Um, we'd like to be able to have that that information provide objective diagnostic information. This is what's wrong. And we'd like to be able to take this information. And now this information is in terms of biomechanical models and and quantitative information, and how that informed surgical planning, the kind of thing that Mark was talking about. So this information about how you walk would say, okay, well the surgeon should be able to, before the surgery, how would this implant affect how a person would walk? Would this make them walk better? Would this be able to get them so that they can get up and down and move around their apartment a bit better? And again, should we, you know, this gets to the idea of patient-specific surgery. For this, we have many different treatments for things like arthritis. And you're going to see some of them today, knee braces, foot inserts, uh, athletic training. They work for some people, but not for everybody. We don't know why. We'd like to say, this is why. This person is more well suited. Their, their morphology, the way that they move, their particular characteristics make them better suited for that. And we think measuring function helps to draw that link together. So, I, I have to acknowledge funding, and, I, and I, uh, I, it's an honor to speak to a, a group of uh, people in uh, Kingston who are so committed to uh, providing and recognizing that need to provide funding to researchers. So it's, 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 it's great having you in lab. So I thought some of the, this lab was um, the, just the construction, of course, ongoing operating costs are another thing, but the funding of the, of the lab came from a variety of sources. It was about, a, I think, about a $2.5 million investment. And it came from uh, federal government, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation put a lot into this, the Ontario provincial government as well. We had contributions from the hospitals at Queen's University. We also had significant donations from private individuals as well, from private um, that you know, kind of got us to where we are. So where is the, uh, so what do we do here? 
Let's go to, uh, let's turn on some system stuff, Amy. Uh, and Simone is going to come in. So what we have is, if you, you should have noticed them already, but the cameras that are located all around the room are flooding the room with infrared light. So in, infrared light is the kind of light that is, comes out of your remote control when you want to change the TV channel or something. You can't see it with the naked eye, but if you have a cool cell phone and you turn it on, apparently you can see the infrared light. And some cell phone cameras pick up infrared. My, mine does. Um, the, uh, the room is flooded with infrared light, and on Simone we have these little reflective bulbs. And all ours are is 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 uh, tape that 3M makes that reflects light back at the cameras, and the cameras are able to track it. But they do it pretty well. You can see all the red dots. So when someone comes in here to get measured, we don't record what they look like or anything about them specifically. We record the locations of these little light. Uh, balls. And you can see, because we have so many of them around the camera and we've done a calibration procedure, we have this information in three dimensions. We have it live, so we can look at this from any perspective. And we can get, we can find where those individual uh, landmarks are to within about a tenth of a millimeter. So it's really accurate, and we can get it at, I don't know, a few thousand times a second or something like that at high height. So if we do something more sporting activity, like, for example, Simone, part of his research is in golf swing analysis. So we can analyze the head of a golf club as it's swinging through. And if you're not me, you swing it much faster. Um, <laughs> golf like that, um, the, uh, so that. So that's the first thing we handle. So from that, we can see where he is. We also, sure, you want to bring that one in? We also, see, where are we going Force now? Plate. Force plate. OK, so the other thing is, one of the real nice things about this lab, um, the uh, actually most expensive thing in the lab almost, is you don't even see it. It's below the floor. So we have sensors embedded into the floor. Oh, yeah. So you see that yellow, little yellow arrow that's going up? There's sensors that are mounted along here that measure the, the, the force or the loading between me and the ground. Because when we're walking and moving, the only thing we're working against is, is gravity, of course, and the ground. So we can start there. If we understand how hard, how hard the person hits the ground and where exactly they hit, hit the ground, they can, we can back up to that stuff. I'll we'll show you a little bit of that. So we have six of these sensors in, in this floor. And we've also prepared this floor so that we can, these things are magnetically mounted. So we're on, a, we're on probably the only level surface in all of Kingston. It's right <laughs> in this little section here. So perfectly level. Um, and we can position those. And the, the advantage of that is if we're doing, if we want to do a, a, a sporting maneuver or some different kind of maneuver, we can get the force plates to exactly where we want to put them for that. Um, anything else I need to see on that? First place good. First place are good? What yeah. are we going to do now? I was going to apply our model. Oh, we could do EMG? Sure, yeah. Let's do muscles. Then you can apply the model. The other thing that we measure is we, of course, when we're moving, we want to know where the joints are and where the body segments are. But we want to have an idea of what the muscles are doing to accomplish this motion. So we've attached, and you can try a couple of these out, this little green blinking light is a little sensor that is measuring this muscle activity. These are exactly the same kind of things that they put on for ECG to measure your heart activity. So your heart is really cool and that it beats, you know, all the muscle contracts at one time to this beautiful little signal. With us, with skeletal muscles, it's a bit more uh, uh, messy, but you can definitely see when he's hopping up on his leg using that muscle, and if he goes the other leg, you see the other one. So from that information, we can start to understand, well, what, this is what the muscles are doing. Here's what the joint orientation is. Here's how hard he's hitting the ground, and we can start to do something. So that's what, you want to try to apply the model? Yeah, let's do it. So this is interesting. We have quite a lot of fun doing this. Um, we have, you know, in terms of just putting the markers on and seeing yourself go, and you can see if you can grab the, the staff or whatever that stick is. But we want to be able to quantify that. And to quantify things in an engineering perspective means you're going to build some kind of model. So for us, it's this musculoskeletal model or a skeleton. So in the background, Amy's applying this, and now this is smarts. Those are just red lights that you saw before. But on the right, now it says, well, this is you know, the old shin bone connected to the knee bone connected to the hip bone. These are actually part of a model. So we understand here's what the knee joint is. Here's the femur, where it is. Here's what the ankle complex is doing. And we can start getting at those precise motions and loads at the joints while they're doing things. And then the next step, of course, 
would be to add uh, muscles to that. And that's a lot of the work that uh, Mr. Brandon in the back has been doing is, 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 is extending this to say, now we have a muscle activity and we can do that. Um, the, what else do we need to say? That's about it, eh? That's okay, so, it, so we're going to start this. Um, Liz is going to, we're going to show you a demonstration of, a, of, of a, a, one of our current, we've got about, I don't know how many, it's probably almost a dozen studies going on in the lab at, at, at current time. We've chosen a few of them to show you. One is a particular study that we're doing with uh, Dr. Borgnet, Dan Borgnet, um, who's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And uh, he's looking at some, a different surgical procedure for knee injuries. And Liz has designed a protocol uh, around that that she's going to explain, dealing with funding. So uh, Dr. Borchick and I uh, are working on a study, and so he has uh, two different surgical techniques, and there's uh, both of them replace the ACL, um, but one of them is thought to be less damaging to the hamstring muscle, and that's really important to a lot of these, um, these athletes because they want to have really good explosive power when they're sprinting, and they also want to have a quick recovery. Um, right now, current ACL reconstruction techniques take about a year to get back to, uh, get back to normal, and that's just normal per gait. And there's some suspicion that differences would persist for sport activities even longer than that. And so for a teenage athlete, being out of the game for a year is, is really, it's really upsetting. And it also may have some long-term implications because there's some evidence that injuring your ACL as a teen or as a young adult might lead to osteoarthritis in that knee uh, when you're older. Um, there's a study in Sweden that did a 16-year follow-up on, on, on people, and they found that 83% of the people had osteoarthritis in their knee that they ruptured the, the ligament in, but only 4% had it in their um, unaffected side. And so there, there is a quite a good link between um, ACL rupture and osteoarthritis. And so we think that if we can understand ACL rupture and, and, and why these degenerative changes occur after rupture, we might understand osteoarthritis in general better. And so um, what we're doing is, this study is really unique uh, because, because we're so tightly tied with the orthopedic surgeons here, um, their clinic is right upstairs. And so the patients can come, see their surgeon, and then come down and see us. And so we get to see them about every three months as they recover. And so most studies look at subjects maybe two years post-op. And so there's a lot of other things that happen in that time. We might have a different rehab protocol, or they're, they're all of those individual variability might mask some changes. So we're going to see them at six weeks post-op, right on through to a year. And so we're hoping that these very subtle changes between technique might come out. And um, the other way that we're going to have the, these changes come out is we're going to do really hard activities. And so when you walk, the differences between limbs are pretty small. But um, when you do a side cut activity, which is how a lot of people blow their ACL in the first place, those differences are really big. And so what I'm going to demonstrate right now is Simone's going to go on over here. And, if, uh, if, if someone would prefer to volunteer for this, we can seat you up. <laughs> there you go. And so, uh, whatever, if not, Simone will. Uh, <laughs> and so, whatever direction the arrow goes, Simone will go, and then we'll be able to look and see at what the muscle activity looks like in his um, in his gastric in his uh, um, in his calf muscles. So yeah. So go to it. Ready? Yep. Go ahead. Nice. Oh, perfect. That's good. And so depending on what direction you go, so the, the shape and size of that, um, that blue line changes. And so that represents the, uh, the force as he's, as he's contacting the plate. So um, you can see that vector as it goes. So we've slowed it right down to about 30 to 70 oh, speed. Um, so it's just going kind of through. Okay. And so you can see big, big force. You can see it's angled. So then the next step of that would then be going to that biomechanical model and then start working. Okay, what exactly are the loads of the ankles, uh, on the angles at the ankle, at the knee, and at the hip as we go on? Yeah, and so my preliminary results suggest that um, if you're in the limb that's injured, um, you're going to have less of a flexion moment. Um, and so you'll, you'll have a, like a stiffer landing than if you are on a healthy limb. And so that graph with the blue and the green there, that's his activity on the um, of the left and the right uh, calf muscles. The green is the left, and the right is is the blue. And you can see the activity in the left is higher because that's the leg that was planted on the force plate, and the uh, the right leg's just sort of long for the ride. Um, and you can see that they're they're out of phase. So as he's in contact with the force plates, 
uh, during the approach, uh, each, each one goes as he's in contact with them successively. Thank you. We're going to bring Scott. He's going to show you some of his research. With you. Uh, okay. <laughs> next up. Um, I'm really interested in uh, what we can do to prevent our osteoarthritis in your knees from getting worse. Um, and it turns out that one of the most commonly prescribed interventions is a knee brace. Is anybody here perhaps use a knee brace? Yeah. So those of you, of you who have, have might have found that they take a while to put on. For, for starters, there's a lot of straps you have. Does anybody want to try one on, or you can do it later if you want? <laughs> so you end up having to go something like this. So you have to put on the bottom strap, and you may have it tangled up, like I do. And, and the goal of this, this device, you can see that it's got an angle here. And the goal is to try to pull your leg into this angle. Because people most often get arthritis on the inside of the knee, not the So Dr. Luzio is pulling this over. You can see what, the, what this would do to your knee is it's going to open up the inside. It's going to open up the gap. Not that drastically, no. <laughs> but that's your goal, is to try and reduce the pressure on the inside of the leg. And so once, once you put this on, it has to be fairly tight in order to do its job. But our question is, how well does that actually work? Because when we start looking at patients who've been prescribed knee braces, they often report that it's just not too comfortable. They wear it for the first few weeks and then stop wearing it because it's just not there. Um, there's, there's other reports that you can change the angle of the brace. And some people say that if they just they don't put on as aggressively, they don't put it on as tight, and they still feel like it's working. And if it's working, if they, if they say that there's less pain, then maybe that's good. But I think what it really tells us is we really don't know what the brace does to you, right? But one of the things we can do in this lab is we can measure the changes when you're walking. How, how is it changing the way I walk? Is it making me sway my body a little more, perhaps, because my leg feels stiff? Or one of the other big changes that we see is that you tend to keep your leg a little straighter when you walk just because you have this thing strapped on. And then the question is, well, if, if all this is supposed to do is keep my leg straight, do I need all this? Could we design a brace better that has a smaller design? Maybe it just has to be a little sleeve that you can put on, and it would give you the same benefit. So my research is, is geared towards really understanding the difference between this brace and this brace. What, what's the current state of the art? Which brace works better? Which brace actually reduces the, the force on your, the inside of your knee joint? And then going from there, we'd like to look at how much of this can I strip away? Maybe I don't need this strap. You know? Already it feels a lot better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe we can get rid of a few of those, make it out of more comfortable material, but still have the same benefit. And that way, people, you can prescribe a brace for, for the activities that they want to do, and it would actually benefit them earlier in their life. It's, it's really interesting, the brace stuff, because, the, because it's so inconsistent. You know, some people it's just wonderful. Um, surgeons will use the brace prescription process for different means. Some of them will will use it to see well how much will this patient tolerate. You know, well, is this somebody who's you know? Uh, and and the goal is it is if you know it makes sense mechanically if you can realign. But a lot of the data says exactly what Scott was saying that that you know it may not be the realignment of the brace itself it may be the fact that it's just changing the way you walk and we we're experimenting with another when you get talking to marcus back here one of his ideas is can we use some kind of biofeedback we can show you a lot of this information while you're walking and can we specifically train you as if you would a high performance athlete to run faster but in this case run in a less or walk in a less painful manner uh Hanan, i think he's going to talk Oh, we got our uh, volunteer yeah. again. So my study, uh, because most of the studies about the osteoarthritis are focused on the biomechanics of the knee, but we believe other joints are, can also influence on the biomechanics of the knee and contribute to development of knee osteoarthritis. So we made some types of sandals that can simulate like different movements of the foot, different lower limb uh, length, and see the effects on the knee as the person is walking, walking fast, doing a common day, a common day by day activities, and see if we can, when we change like the foot motion or change or try to simulate lower limb length discrepancies, if it will affect the, the biomechanics of the knee. So Simone is wearing like two different types of sandals. One is bigger than the other one. So. Uh, we can evaluate, as this was demonstrated, 
with the force plate, with the motion capture system, we can simulate the influence of low energy discrepancy on the biomechanics of the heat. So we have some data about with like health individuals so far. So we're now we're starting and we study with individuals with new aid to see if the effects are, are applicable to, with, to individuals with new aid. You can try some of them if you want. They are size nine. <laughs> you can see the effects, feel how it goes. And this is again getting to the, one of the, you know, Anand came at me at one of these, so Anand's a, um, a physiotherapist by trade, and uh, recognizing that a lot of the patients with osteoarthritis have, you know, foot alignment issues. They'd be more pronated where yeah. orthotics might help, or, and his theories that we argued about for about four or five months, I think, back and forth, yeah. were that some of these effects of the ankle can be such that that may be a contributing factor to what's going on at the knee. And it's really an overlooked area um, in terms of the need, perhaps, to understand these and, and, and treat these, perhaps, earlier than you would. So he's got a really nice experimental paradigm uh, that we're working with uh, again. And all of these projects are, are good collaborations between the orthopedic department uh, and the physio department and, and that's an engineer. Yeah. 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 Yeah.